This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Hey, and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 584, and we welcome Larry Sloan, the CEO of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Uh, looking forward to a great show. We're calling this an essential organization. AIHA recalibrates for the COVID-19 era. Looking forward to a great conversation with Larry. Before we get started, let's make sure we thank our sponsors. They are the reason IAQ Radio is still free for our listeners. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. Learn more at acgih.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. Learn more at cirriscience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association. Learn more at iaqa.org. And the Restoration Industry Association. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. IAQ Radio Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Learn more at aemlinc.com. Particles Plus. Learn more at particlesplus.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to report that Mr. Clayton Shaw all flooring inspector in Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada, was first to identify Dalton, Georgia, as the city which became the center for carpet manufacturing in the U.S. following World War II because the city had a ready pool of workers experienced in tufting. The IQ Radio Trivia Question for today, Friday, May 1, 2020, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company providing unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here's today's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Who were the original founders of the AIHA? Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. I also forgot to mention our newest sponsor is uh, AIHA. Learn more at AIHA.org. Uh, Larry Sloan is joining us today. Larry is the CEO of the AIHA. He stepped into the role at the AIHA's October 2016 meeting. Prior to this, he was a president and CEO for seven years of the Society of Chemical Manufacturers and Affiliates, a trade association representing the U.S. specialty chemical industry. Uh, he also entered into the nonprofit sector in 2001, first by serving as a director and with a subsequent promotion to president at the Adhesive and Sealant Council. Larry also began his career as a chemical engineer at Air Products and later worked for Nalco Chemical Company. He is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a BS in chemical engineering and later returned for his MBA at the Northwestern University. Larry, welcome to IAQ Radio. Thank you very, very much, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here, and we're excited about being a new sponsor. It's great to have you on board. Um, Larry, what? I've been a longtime fan of AIHA, and, and our old technical director, Dr. Dietrich Weil, was uh, the guy that really got me going with AIHA over the years. But uh, I'm wondering, as far as your background goes, you started out in in industry doing, doing work with chemicals and so on, and then uh, you got into the association world. How? How and why did you get involved with association management? It's a very circuitous path, but I like to say that everything that I've done professionally led up to my decision to enter the nonprofit. What happened was in the late 90s, I was actually working for my father's business, and we were manufacturer representatives for water and wastewater treatment equipment. So I was driving around the countryside, visiting industry and municipalities, helping them with their uh, equipment selections for uh, treatment of water and wastewater. And I did that for about seven years. And honestly, I decided at the end of the 90s that being a salesman on the road 
was getting a little bit tiring and I didn't really think that there was a great future for the role of being a manufacturer's representative. And I think that was a wise decision. And I had dinner with a very close friend of mine who I knew from engineering school way back in the day. And she was running a trade association. And so we were having dinner this one night and she started educating me on what is the nonprofit sector and what are trade associations. And she said, you know, with all the experience you've got in the chemical sector and your sales and marketing experience with your technical background, you would be great to run uh, or at least start working in a manufacturing oriented trade association. And she said, why don't you start looking at some of the chemical trade associations that are available here in the DC area? And so long story short, I made some applications and I got my first gig with Adhesive and Sealing Council. So it really was very serendipitous having this dinner with her and launching my career literally from that point in time. And, and now you're with the AIHA and you know, you, here we go into COVID-19 era. And uh, I put together the title saying, you know, an essential organization. I think people know that certain organizations and certain uh, construct or certain uh, workers are essential workers. I like to think of AIHA as an essential organization during this time. And you've also been kind of recalibrating things at, at AIHA. So I wonder if first we could talk a little bit about some of the essential information on uh, workplace safety, environmental health, and, and what the response so far of AIHA and its members has been with respect to this whole COVID-19 outbreak. You know, it's just, <clears throat> excuse me, horrific what, with the pandemic and all, but it's really provided a, a once in a lifetime opportunity, if you will, I think for AIHA and the profession to step up and really explain what it is that we do and what is the value that this profession offers. It's an extremely exciting time and we've been very busy since, uh, literally since the middle of February when news broke out that the, uh, that the coronavirus had hit the shores of the US. So first things first, you know, right from the get go, we launched a, a web portal, and I believe you've got a link to the COVID-19 web portal. And the portal contains access to a lot of different information. There's AIHA produced collateral documents. There are links to various third parties, such as the CDC, NIOSH, OSHA, and others. And there's also uh, a lot of really good information uh, from some other providers. You know, everybody and their brother these days is starting to develop a lot of uh, safe return to work uh, documentation. And we're going to be launching a whole new portal, not official yet, but we're going to be developing and launching a whole new portal to help industry sectors understand best practices and how to return to work from the perspective of the employer, from the perspective of the employee, and from the perspective of the general public, if you need to interface with that particular industry. So that's the first point I want to make. And the website is constantly being updated. So when you have a chance, please take a look at it. And we always welcome feedback. Secondly, I do want to thank our volunteers for their assistance in producing, again, a variety of documents. We've got new infographics uh, and uh, other materials that are helping to clarify protocol. Everything from proper usage of respirators. What's the difference between a, a respirator and a mask? Because there's a lot of confusion out there in the marketplace. And we've also decided to make several documents available at no charge. They used to be behind the uh, uh, storefront, if you will, but now we're making anything that's pertaining to COVID and pandemics uh, posted and available for free on this web portal. We have launched an extensive campaign as well to correct these misunderstandings, again, about the usage of PPE. And we've had a variety of interviews with mass media, such as the New York Times, NPR, and the Wall Street Journal. So that's just a few examples of things that we've done in response to COVID. What, what kind of inquiries, questions are you getting from, from the, the practitioners out there, your, your membership? Are they uh, looking for certain, I, I, I see there's a huge list of resources there. I, there were a couple I wanted to maybe pull up here, but let's, I don't wanna get too stuck in that, but uh, very good stuff on like how to do a respirator fit test. I think a lot of people, are very confused on that. I also noticed the journal on there. Can you, uh, and I'm not that familiar with that journal. Can you mention that for listeners just for a minute? So the, uh, you're talking about the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Health? Yes. Yes, that is a uh, joint uh, collaborative effort between ACGIH and AIHA. 
And that is a, uh, a more scholarly publication, which is peer reviewed. It is published almost monthly. And that contains uh, much more, if you will, uh, scientific uh, research based articles. So again, this is peer reviewed and the articles are sourced from uh, academicians and other researchers, uh, both in and outside of the government. So that's uh, again, a joint effort between ACGIH and AIHA. And uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing additional uh, references to uh, pandemics, if you will, and COVID in future issues. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see organizations like yours and ACGIH and IAQA. I know later we want to talk a little bit about the, uh, I forget the name of that group, but um, the Allied Industries uh, Association. Uh, it's really exciting to see people working together like that. And uh, I, I just think, I hope that's something that we're going to continue to see as time goes on. I know the IICRC has been working more closely with RIA, and, and, and I, I think this is really great stuff for the industry. Um, so with respect to the COVID-19 and AIHA, I wonder if you could tell listeners a little bit, you know, we're all dealing with changes because of this. And, and by the way, I didn't realize how big your organization is. So let's start with that. How many employees do you have? And how has this whole issue changed the way you all are working? Um, I, I understand you're doing a lot of remote work. If you could talk a little more about that. Sure. It's been transformational, quite frankly. Uh, we have uh, 52 staff uh, on the payroll. And uh, normally nonprofits uh, talk about their operating budgets. So we're a 16 to $17 million operation. And uh, for those that are not familiar, AIJ is a, it's a rather unique organization. We've got a lot, of, a lot of moving parts. It's not just the core professional membership. We've got about 8,000 or so individual members that make up the uh, association. But we also have uh, three what are called limited liability corporations. So real quick, we have a, a lab accreditation program. We have a proficiency analytical testing program. And we have a series of registry programs. And again, each one of those is an LLC. And then we have two foundations. We have an education foundation that provides scholarships for students. And uh, we also have another foundation that provides uh, the emergency response planning guideline reference data points. So when you look at the two foundations and the three LLCs and the mothership AIHA, we have an allied association that's being managed by us called the Product Stewardship Society. And then we have 65 some odd local chapters around the country. We call them local sections, including one in Pittsburgh. So it's a very complex organization. But to get back to your question, uh, COVID has really changed the day-to-day -day operations. We are now all working remotely five days a week. We communicate via conference call and video conferencing every day of the week. We, uh, of course, have pivoted on our virtual conference, which I think we're going to get to in a little bit which is now going from a face-to-face -face meeting in Atlanta to 100% virtual on June 1st to the 3rd. And one thing I'll make a comment about is that normally at the conference, we offer a, uh, a fun run, which supports the Education Foundation. So this year we're pivoting and we're doing a virtual fun run. So we're trying to adjust on the fly as best as we can while not losing sight of the mission of the organization. Yeah, that's a lot and you've got people all around the D.C. area, I guess, working from their homes and, and coordinating with each other. And I, we talked a little before the show. I think you felt like that's really working out pretty well. You know, it is. I am a, I'm a people person, and I like to be able to see people, you know, directly in the flesh. And it was a little challenging for me in the beginning to be working remotely and relying on the video calls. But we're all very good about when we jump on a call to one another, we do show our video cams. Uh, for the most part, and uh, we're having the same level and number of meetings that we normally do. Of course, there's a, a core set of teams of uh, staff members that are working uh, very hard behind the scenes to put on AIHCE virtual conference. We have a senior leadership team, which is made up of uh, 10 of the department heads and myself, and we meet every couple weeks as well. So, you know, we're doing the best we can. We have what's called uh, virtual happy minutes every Thursday or Friday afternoon. We all try to get together on our cameras and uh, see one another and wave at each other and hold up our favorite beverage. So we're trying to do the best we can with the uh, technology that we've got. Interesting. Let, let's talk a little bit about AIH, AIHCE, the, the annual event. Um, it was scheduled for, well, why don't we, John, can you put up the, uh, 
the link for that one. I think we have that. Let's yep. talk a little bit about how you're going to pull this off. That's typically a pretty big event. How many people generally will, will attend that event, Larry? So normally it is a very large flagship event. And, and quite frankly, it's a phenomenal opportunity for us on staff to, again, connect face to face with literally thousands of our members. Normally an AIHC will attract between uh, 4,500 and 5,000 individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of those folks will just attend the professional development courses, the PDCs as we call them, and others will attend the education sessions, and then others will attend both. But the decision to cancel the face-to-face, -face, as you can imagine, uh, was not an insignificant one. We uh, you know, spent a lot of time trying to look at all the options that were available to us. And finally, we got to the point uh, towards the end of March that there was no way from a public health perspective that we could offer this event in an in-person format. Only to find out literally a week or so later that the convention center that we were gonna have the conference at was being converted into a makeshift hospital. Hmm. And several of the hotels that we had uh, contracted with were literally shut down. So it obviously made the decision a lot easier knowing that these venues were no longer available to us. But very quickly, uh, Joe, we're gonna offer the conference in an all virtual format. It's gonna be held on the same dates June 1st to June 3rd, we're going to have five different concurrent tracks and the programming will start each day roughly 8 a.m. Eastern time and run till 4.30, 5.30, 6.30 in the evening. We're gonna offer the professional development courses on Thursday and Friday, June 4th and 5th, and then the following week after. Now we're not gonna have the breadth and the number of PDCs that we normally offer but what we're envisioning is offering a select number of PDCs right after the conference, and then we'll be looking at offering additional PDCs later on in the summer. So the education will continue over the course of the summer. Most of the sessions are gonna be pre-recorded. The speakers will be available live to answer questions at the end of the session after we air the pre-recording. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of wrap things up, the sessions include obviously a session on COVID-19, international affairs, our content portfolio priorities, such as occupational exposure banding, changing workforce, big data, sensors, total exposure health, and then also some information on standards and opioids. I noticed there's an exhibit tab there. Are, are you still going to try and do some kind of virtual exhibits? We are. As you know, the Expo normally attracts over 200 companies, and we made the opportunity available to those exhibitors to pivot to a virtual Expo. I would say we probably have between 50 and uh, 70. I don't have the exact number at my fingertips. The number continues to grow. Uh, ACGIH will be a free exhibitor. We're very pleased to offer them that courtesy as part of our agreement with them. But these exhibitors will have a portal on the platform and they'll be able to promote their products and services as they would in a face-to-face -face event. So I, how does that work? I'm just curious. That's something that I haven't really dealt with much. So people will be able to go to that portal, yep. look at each different uh, exhibitor, and then maybe click on a link where they can talk or chat with someone? I believe that's the case. Uh, again, I don't have the specifics, but for those that sign up for the event, you'll be getting very clear instructions. I also know there's going to be what are called learning pavilions. And if you, uh, if you may recall at the face-to-face -face meeting in the expo hall, there's a, uh, a learning center, if you will, right on the show floor. And that's where exhibitors will actually give, uh, you know, specific talks about their products or services. And so several of the exhibitors have decided to spotlight themselves and we have signed them up for these learning pavilion sessions that will be held concurrent with the expo online. Everything's gonna be online. Wow. Sounds like yeah. a huge challenge, but it's also, I think, a good opportunity for you. It is. My team is very excited about trying something different, and I think we're going to learn some very interesting lessons that I believe is going to help embellish our online education in the months and years ahead. Look, there's no substitute for a face-to-face -face meeting, right? Everybody wants to connect in real time. Everybody wants to uh, you know, take advantage of all the networking sessions, and unfortunately, that is a compromise of going virtual. But I will say, when you look at the entire program, we're actually offering a couple more CM hours than we normally do. So if you sign up for the virtual conference, you will get upwards of 20 CM hours. 
And then anybody that signs up for the conference gets uh, access to the on-demand, and that's always available from the conference. And the on-demand means that after the show concludes, you can go online and you can continue to earn hours by viewing sessions that you did not have an opportunity to attend during the conference. And so over the course of the rest of the year, you can you know, really rack up a lot of hours toward your CIH designation. Will, will you have a keynote speaker or speakers? We uh, made a change to the, uh, to the keynote address. We normally had another gentleman, and unfortunately, he's in the medical profession, so he had to uh, back out of the event after what happened with COVID. But we have uh, secured a gentleman named Rene Rodriguez, and we have had him before at some of our conferences. He is extremely well-received. He is a leadership guru uh, across the uh, variety of industries, including industrial hygiene. What we're going to do with Renee is we're going to have him actually open up the uh, conference on June the 1st. And the title of his uh, opening session is called Harnessing the Power of Courage. And basically, he's going to introduce what's called the Courage Scale, which is a measure for figuring out how do we all live, quote unquote, above the line during these difficult times. And he's got a simple model that he's going to share with everybody on how do we reframe the narrative? How do we take this this adversity and the stress that we're all under and harness the power of courage. So we're pretty excited about learning about this tool, better understanding how we're gonna be able to manage our emotional states. We're gonna receive some tips for those of us that are working at home on how we, again, quote unquote, live above the line. We're gonna understand a little more about courage, what does it mean, and help us to figure out how do we generate a, a broader culture on what it means to live above the line. So that's going to be on Monday, June 1st, first thing in the morning. And then at the close of the conference on Wednesday afternoon, June 3rd, we're gonna have another presentation by Renee. This one is called the Neuroscience of Influence. And he's gonna break down the neuroscience of what influence means. Help us understand the range of influence that we as IHOH professionals can use, uh, know when and how to use them. And we're going to build our own power base so that we have the capacity to be influential. You know, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I personally try to, to, to kind of step up our game as a profession, how do we better communicate with people that are not like ourselves? In other words, how do we, how do we more effectively communicate at the business C-suite table when we're being brought into conversations by upper level management? And I think this conversation that Renee's going to lead on June the 3rd is going to help us build our skill set in that area. Boy, that's a that's a tough one, and I, I hope he is successful there because I'm I'm seeing a lot of that now, Larry. This this whole, you know, trying to deal with the county commissioners and trying to get them to understand some of the, uh, you know, unfortunately there's some some less than ideal practices going on right now with respect to cleaning and disinfecting, and um, how to communicate that without turning them off. I think is a, is a tough thing at times. You know they. They're looking at the bottom line oftentimes and you, and you try and explain to them that, you know, just maybe spraying something here is not as good as doing a more thorough cleaning. And, and how do you get that through to them without, you know, insulting them, I guess? I don't, I don't know. Is that, yeah. is that It's, uh, you know, it's interesting, Joe. One of the things, just on a personal note, one of the things that I've been studying up on is something called emotional intelligence, which it, it sounds a little new agey and uh, kind of kumbaya, but it really is a set of skills that one can acquire at any time in their life to better understand how you communicate. In other words, there's a, there's a better way of communicating so you don't put somebody on the defensive and there's a way of really trying to figure out how do you relate to somebody on their level? And we have started to offer a series of what we call soft skill webinars aimed at the IH professional so they become a little more adept at kind of reading people a little differently, understanding that, you know what, the message that we bring forth is a very important one, but there's a right way to tell that message and get on somebody else's bandwidth, and there's a not so good way of telling it. So it's all about the nuance of how we tell the story and how we present our arguments so that we can get their buy-in. And I think you mentioned the key word, story. Uh, I mean, yeah. people listen to stories more than lectures. Uh, so. I think that's a very good point. Hey, before we move away from the conference and all, I, Cliff, I wanted to make sure you get a chance to jump in here because I know you've been very interested in this whole virtual conference idea for years. 
Well, no, I'm just kind of amazed how well you have it together. I mean, you seem to have thought of many things that I haven't thought about or Joe hasn't thought about. And, you know, wow, I'm, I'm really impressed. I do have one question for you. Who was the oldest employee working for AIHA and how have they adapted to this working from home and technology and, and, and so on and so forth? As an old guy, I mean, I'll be 70 this year. So as an old guy, I find myself challenged by technology. So sure, just, sure. So the oldest uh, employee currently on staff, uh, a little shout out to Jim Myers. Uh, Jim Myers is actually, ironically, in our, he's in our marketing department and he does a lot of the design work behind uh, all the guidance documents and the publications uh, that we put together. Jim is going to be celebrating his 30th anniversary with us in the next few days. And he is the only employee, as I understand it, that actually came from Ohio, which is where AIJ was headquartered before we moved to the DC area. So, being who Jim is, he is very comfortable with working remotely, and obviously he's very comfortable with technology. Hey, let me uh, let me ask you this. AIHA, I've been a local section member here in Pittsburgh for years, and, and I've followed their government affairs, and um, they've, I feel like they've always done a good job of advocating for their membership with, with government. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this, and, and if anything... Um, you know, AIHA had to do with the recent acknowledgement that health and safety professionals are essential personnel. Did, were you, was your government affairs involved in that or uh, did that just come about naturally? Yes, uh, I'm very, very pleased. Uh, my colleague, Mark Ames, who's our director of government relations, uh, really spearheaded this initiative to ensure that occupational health and safety employees and professionals were deemed essential. And so uh, the federal government actually has a guidance document. We have been inserted into that guidance document and it's actually something called the uh, CISA Cyber Structure Guidelines. And that's actually housed within the Department of Homeland Security. But the uh, exact language is that the uh, workplace safety workers, such as workers who anticipate, recognize, evaluate, and control workplace conditions, that may cause workers illness or injury shall be deemed essential workers. So we're very, very pleased. Uh, there is a, uh, a web link that I had provided to your team. Uh, it's not critical that we show it, but it is actually uh, uh, on the Department of Homeland Security's website. And there's a rather long URL that we can make available to the listeners later on. But that was a big accomplishment because what happens, Joe, is that the states look to the federal government for guidance. And so what we're finding now is that multiple states are codifying the IH professional as essential in their state regulations as well. You've also been pretty successful over the years at getting certified industrial hygienists written into, or uh, how should I say it? Um, for instance, with mold uh, licensing, or in, in the past it was asbestos licensing, you, you've been pretty successful at advocating for your membership to not have to, you know, jump through a bunch of extra hoops to do, say, some kind of asbestos consulting or something like that. How big is your government affairs group and, and how have they had such, uh, it just seems like they're, they're, maybe they're bigger than I realize or, or, or maybe uh, they just get more done than, than their size would indicate. Well, if, if Mark Ames, again, is uh, going to listen to this webcast at some point or podcast, you know, he'll be very pleased. He is a department of one. And I tell you, uh, I will let him know how impressed you are with the activities that we uh, manage. He does have, obviously, the marketing communications department uh, to assist him with uh, communication pieces and press releases and the like. So he uh, utilizes uh, one individual in the marketing communications department to assist in that area. Uh, he also relies upon me, you know, where I can add some value. And then he has, of course, you know, our membership department. And so if he needs to get the word out to uh, our you know, various volunteer groups or local sections around the country, he can leverage the, uh, the input of the management team. He also has a, a government relations committee, which is an overarching committee comprised of volunteers. There are probably a good uh, close to 400 members that serve on that committee. And wow. there are various task forces that are set up within that committee. 
So literally it does take a village to get all this work done, but Mark really is the uh, one full-time government relations staffer that orchestrates the whole thing. I think that, that you have 400 volunteers assisting with that shows how important that is to the organization and to their membership. Uh, I think they feel, they obviously feel it's very important to, to have a good uh, connection with the regulators and to make sure that uh, AIHA has input in some of this health and safety uh, regulations and guidance that uh, the United States puts out in the States as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Great. You know, in addition to the uh, essential worker, there's obviously other issues that we've been following. Uh, one that we actually are still ramping up is the uh, the COVID-19, uh, it's called the Every Worker Protection Act of 2020. Uh, that would require OSHA to issue an emergency temporary standard that would protect all employees from exposure to the virus. And that would then be followed by a permanent standard. So this is something we're advocating on very strongly as we speak. Uh, but then there's a lot of other, you know, kind of the normal routine issues that, uh, you know, they're not on the back burner. Think about, for example, we're coming up on the, unfortunately, the uh, natural disaster season, right? You know, you have the tornadoes and soon we'll be in the hurricane season and then the wildfires. And so what's going to happen this summer with COVID and sheltering in place? How do you navigate that if there's a fire, you know, in your neighborhood or you are uh, trying to escape a, you know, a hurricane? You know, you can't all aggregate in a convention center right now the way you used to be able to. So we got to navigate that issue very carefully. And then there's other things like occupational hearing protection, uh, a lot of work being done at the state level there, and other issues like the opioid epidemic and how do you protect the first responders from uh, exposure to opioids when they arrive at a crime scene, things of that nature. Interesting. Interesting. All right, we're going to break for halftime here. We'll be back with Larry Sloan, the uh, CEO of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. We're talking an essential organization, AIHA recalibrates for the COVID-19 era. We'll be back in 60 seconds with our guests. IAQ Radio Industry sponsors are Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Siri, the cleaning industry research institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at siriscience.org. That's C I R I science.org. A C G I H, advancing the careers of professionals working in the environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety communities. Interested in defining their science at A C G I H.org. All right, we're back. We also want to welcome on board as a sponsor, the American Industrial Hygiene Association. We've got their CEO here on the show today. And, and Larry, as I understand it, AIHA is just about ready to announce their brand refresh. Um, and can you give listeners a little, you know, a little preview maybe? I know you can't maybe tell them everything you'd like to at this point, but uh, what's going on with the brand refresh? So uh, this is really one of my favorite projects that I'm directly involved in. And uh, again, a little kudos out to Sue Marquesi, who's our managing director of marketing and communications. This has really been her baby from day one. So this effort actually began just before I came on the scene uh, early in 2016. And uh, back then, the uh, U.S. Department of Labor had approached AIHA asking us for some input on pipeline issues in the uh, occupational health and safety profession. Concerns about, you know, do we have enough graduates in this discipline to 
keep the pipeline full and you know, keep workers healthy and safe uh, at work. And so out of this uh, outreach, if you will, we formed a task force and one thing led to another and uh, through a series of meetings, formal surveys, focus groups with various stakeholders, we better understood that the term industrial hygienist was not being perceived very favorably by people not like ourselves. We all know what industrial hygiene and what the term industrial hygienist uh, signifies, but if you are somebody who's in management or maybe even uh, human resources, or maybe you're just a student in high school, you have no idea what that term means. And the old adage is that, oh, industrial hygienist, somebody who cleans teeth, right? Are you like a dental hygienist? No. So we realized we had a lot of work to do to really clean up our act, so to speak, no pun intended. And we launched the first thing is called the IMIH campaign. And that was a Twitter handle. And we developed that campaign to help our members communicate awareness in their respective communities about what industrial hygiene means. And so over the last several years, we provided our members with a variety of tools that they've been able to take out to their schools and their communities and educate students, young and old, about occupational health and safety and what a great career profession that it is. Jump forward over the next couple of years, we brought in some research experts and we developed a lot of data to chart our path forward. And it became obvious that not only did we need to better define the term industrial hygiene, we just felt that the overall brand of the AIHA needed to be refreshed. So with board support, we moved forward and we uh, studied some changes to our logo. We looked at different taglines and just as importantly as just changing colors and shapes, we developed a robust set of what's called positioning statements. These statements are very important because they articulate the value of the profession to different audiences. In my office, there is a whiteboard and Sue and I actually sat down three and a half years ago and we mapped out who are all the audiences that we ultimately want to target with this brand refresh. And it's literally an umbrella of probably a dozen or so audiences ranging from junior and high school students who don't know what they want to do with themselves and you know, what kind of career path do they want to take all the way through business C-suite, EH&S management, guidance counselors, career counselors, human resources, the military, the organized labor sector, and a few others. And so ultimately, we're gonna be telling our story in a very targeted way to each one of these different audiences. Now, earlier this year, COVID came along, and Sue and I sat down and I said, we have got to capitalize on this horrific pandemic. So we are jumpstarting our outreach campaign and we are working with an outside PR agency based out of Chicago. And they are working with us very closely now to roll out our awareness framed around the COVID discussion. And that's gonna be our kickoff to the grassroots campaign. But ultimately come June the 1st, we will officially launch the new brand, the new logo, uh, the new tagline and all of that, and it's going to be sequentially executed and deployed over the coming months. So it's a very, very exciting and a very timely time for the association, what with the pandemic facing all of us. We, we look forward to following up on that, Larry, with you or one of your staff or, you know, maybe one of your uh, more prominent members. And uh, we, can, we can do a little show about that when the time comes and maybe follow up on how things went with the conference. I think and we've done that quite a few times, and I'll be attending at least some of the sessions, and sometimes we'll do a recap show. So I look forward to that. Um, speaking of recaps or uh, re relaunches, I guess, uh, we recently did a show with J. David Miller, Dr. Miller, uh, on the revised Green Book, Recognition, Evaluation, and Control of Indoor Mold. And um, I, I always find him fascinating as he's just a, a really uh, – he's got a depth of knowledge and, and he can just remember studies and research papers like no one I've ever talked to. But anyway, I believe that was an AIHA bestseller at one time. You correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what kind of demand are you seeing for the revision and, and why did you feel it was necessary to have a revision? You are absolutely correct. This is really a bestseller across all of the AIHA press. Uh, in the first month alone, 
we sold over ten thousand dollars of copies. Uh, hmm. We're up to over one hundred and thirty, and it's still going strong. There's a lot of reasons why we decided to publish the uh, the second edition. About 80% of the material is actually new or substantially different from the first edition. The uh, health information is now better aligned with uh, epidemiological and medical information on things like environmental allergens and mold. And it's all consistent now with the American Academy for Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. So there's a better congruency, if you will. Since the first edition was published in 2008, there's also been changes to the taxonomy of fungi. And mm. so many of the fungi terminology that were discussed in the first edition are now referenced by different names. So all of those names have been updated in the second edition. There's also been a good deal of work that's been done over the last 12 years to update guidelines on mold and dampness. Uh, in this second edition, the material on building, on building inspections uh, is now better aligned with current best practices there are now medical and engineering perspectives that are integrated through the use of new figures and references that are contained in the book. Uh, let me just wrap up here by saying that, um, you know, allergists talk to their patients about things called facilitating factors. Uh, these are conditions, for example, you know, that are necessary for the survival of allergen producing contaminants. Some of these factors might favor cockroaches and house mites. Uh, dust mites that might favor mold and vice versa. So physicians have, you know, suggested approaches that determine when you need a professional assessment for mold that might be appropriate, appropriate for those people that are suffering from allergies. All of the protocols for this purpose are now outlined in the Green Book. So these physician and medical professionals best practices are now integrated into this book. So we're very excited about the updating of that material. And finally, I'll just mention that the protocol that is designed for mold and dampness investigations, you know, they require a very a detailed ex exploration or an investigation of the building's HVAC system. And a lot of these protocols were developed by ASHRAE members who are also members of AIHA. So we've integrated a lot of this third party knowledge into the second edition. So it's a much more comprehensive tome, if you will, on the subject matter. I think that last point's very important, the, the integration of the HVAC system and then working with ASHRAE members and ASHRAE on that. I think that's, that's just another example of how working together we're going to do a better job. Um, we also did a show about a year ago now. It's, I, I went back and looked. I'm like, wow, it's been a year already. And by the way, we're going to do a couple follow-ups for listeners on the Green Book. We're going to do a couple more shows because we just barely got into it with uh, Dr. Miller. But we also did a show about a year ago with Don Weeks on um, the AIHA's frequently asked questions about spore trap air sampling for mold for direct examination. And um, I was curious, are there other mold-related documents being updated or created at this point? There are. And one of the things that I want to comment on is that even with the response to COVID, our goal here is to really start developing more materials, collateral documents that are more consumer friendly, right? There's so much confusion out there as we know about respirator versus mask and, you know, mold versus fungi versus algae versus all the bacterial versus viral. It is our responsibility to add as much clarity as we can to the public discourse. And I hope that as we get into the whole brand refresh campaign, we will be able to contribute positively to educating the general public in some small way. Now, going back to your question, we do have a, a new booklet that's going to come out in the next couple months. It's called Facts About Mold. And this, again, is going to be a consumer-facing publication. Another project is an update to the assessment, remediation, and post-remediation verification of mold in buildings. That's all commonly referred to as the Mold Guideline Book. That's being updated. And there's also, as an aside, we have a brand new project team uh, that's focused on the Legionella issue. And as uh, those that are members of the committee know, there is a Legionella guideline document that's being updated. And we're gonna be developing a new, what's called a body of knowledge for those that want to step up their game and become an expert in the whole Legionella realm. 
So what's going to happen out of the body of knowledge team is we're going to develop what's called a, a job task analysis. And that JTA could lead to some sort of a certificate. So as you can see, Joe, there's a lot of really good activity around the mold spectrum. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I think this is a good point place to mention AIHA's uh, body of knowledge for indoor air quality and, and work we did. I, I was actually part of that committee with the Indoor Air Quality Association. Um, are you, and I think that's been updated as well. Is that accurate? That is correct. In 2018, the Indoor Air Quality BOK was updated and it now includes uh, Indoor Air Quality Management and Planning. The uh, update was a collaborative effort between the Indoor Air Quality Association and our IEQ committee. Uh, everybody felt that this update would provide better tools and information that are necessary to more effectively manage uh, an indoor environmental quality program for a building. And the idea for the update actually originated from a proposed uh, LEED, L-E-E-D, pilot credit that was developed by the U.S. Green Building Council that would eventually replace the current IAQ testing protocol. So we wanted to make sure that the body of knowledge was better aligned with this new pilot credit. Hmm. Yep. Interesting. I, I also want to mention um, another document that I just – I heard through, I think Jack Springston mentioned maybe on an email or somewhere that you're, you're working on a COVID-19 document as well. What's, uh, what's that one, uh, Larry? If you could tell us a little bit about that one and when it will be out for people to look at. So there are two uh, guidance documents that have just been published, uh, and Jack was a participant, I believe, in both. Uh, the Indoor Environmental Quality within AIJ has been extremely active over the last couple months, and I want to just thank Jack and, and everybody who serves on that committee uh, it's led by a gentleman named Dave Krauss out of Florida, and they have just been going gangbusters. So the first piece that the group generated was a uh, guidance document on reopening closed buildings. So think about all the commercial industrial space that's out there that has been shut down over the last several months. And think about water systems in these buildings that need to be taken care of. And obviously Legionella is one of many issues that we need to be contending about. So this document walks the reader through common sense approaches to how do you safely and effectively reopen closed buildings. So that's document number one. And then the second document that we just released this past week is general manufacturing plant hygiene. And it is amazing to me as I reach out to my fellow association CEOs that run these trade associations uh, here in Washington, how much of an interest level there is in both of these pieces. And so both documents are now available to you and the general public, and they are both posted on the coronavirus webpage that we displayed at the top of the hour. And we'll, Cliff, if we could get links to those in your blog, I think that would be great. Those, those are, I can imagine, general uh, maintenance plant hygiene or general management of plant hygiene. I didn't quite get that, but it just makes me think of the meatpacking uh, issue that's going on right now, the, the problems they're having, and, and they need documents like that. Has um, AIHA been involved in that at all? Were you called in? I, I know they had uh, OSHA in, and they may have had CDC in, but I don't know whether they brought any of your people along to uh, look at that issue. No, we've not been brought in specifically to the, uh, to the meatpacking issue, but uh, just as an aside, and I alluded to this earlier, in the podcast, um, we are working on, and this is not yet released, although the website is live, uh, we're working on a series of guidance documents. Again, when I say guidance document, think about two, three, four page documents, okay? These are not white papers. Uh, these are not scholarly papers, if you will. These are shorter pieces that are designed for, uh, for the layperson, for the general public. And over, literally over the last week, we have developed four to five, and we've got more that are in the pipeline, guidance documents on safe return to work practices broken down by industry sector. So for example, we've just uh, released one on restaurants. We've released one on retail establishments. Another one on um, the construction sites. Another one on hair and nail salons. And there's several other ones that are in the pipeline. Each of these pieces comes at the return to work issue from three perspectives. What do I need to understand as an employer or as an owner? What do I need to understand as an employee working at that facility? 
And what do I need to be mindful of as a consumer or somebody from the general public that might frequent that facility, for example, restaurant or retail? We have a brand new web portal, which we'll be uh, communicating out next week, and it will house all of these guidance documents. Uh, I am envisioning that there will be a document on uh, general manufacturing as well. But the overall premise to the development of all these documents, Joe, is we really wanted to provide resources mostly for smaller sized businesses that lack that internal expertise uh, that the bigger guys have. So we really came at this from, if you're a small business owner in any of these business sectors, what do I need to know to reopen safely? Again, that focus on bringing that information in a form that the general, you know, the, the building owner, the building manager, the people working in the buildings will, will be able to use it and understand it and uh, implement it. So I, th I think that's a great uh, initiative. Let me, uh, let's do this. John, let's go to the roundup. We just want to go around the horn here. I want to start with Cliff and see if Cliff has a final question. And then I have one. And then we always give you the last opportunity to add anything we might have missed. Cliff? Um, yes. Uh, one final question. Joe mentioned earlier in the podcast about the um, MOUs with allied industry partners. If you could just comment on that. Sure. Yeah. We signed on to this agreement uh, last fall. Uh, Don Weeks was integral in getting us uh, invited to the table. There are, my understanding, and I hope I don't miss anybody out, there are six organizations that are part of this MOU plus AIHA, and I can just give them real quickly. They're ACGIH, there's the Indoor Air Quality Association, the National Air Duct Cleaners Association, the Basement Health Association, the American Bio Recovery Association, and the Environmental Information Association. And the whole purpose of this MOU was to enable us to promote and share our collective collateral documents, guidance documents, fact sheets, webinars, and such. And when COVID hit us a couple months back, one of the first things that uh, this Allied Industry Partners Coalition put into practice was the, uh, the hosting of a, of a COVID-19 webinar. And that was very well attended. This was about three or four weeks ago. And several of the associations each had a role in this webinar. The recording is available on our COVID webpage with everything else. And David Krause from our Indoor Environmental Quality Committee had a, uh, a little bit of a cameo role towards the end of this webinar. So we're very pleased to be a part of this coalition called the Allied Industry Partners. Well, thank you. That's, I think that's an important one because it'll, it'll help give a little more weight, lend a little more weight when you've got a group of organizations all you know, saying the same thing or, or using the same uh, protocol or, you know, uh, confirming that they're all following the same standard or whatever the case may be. I think that's going to be interesting to watch as, as time goes on. I got one final question, the webinar thing, this, this whole webinar thing. I, I don't know how I'm ever going to have enough time to attend all the great webinars that are being presented right now. Um, you know, the International Society for Indoor Air Quality and Climate has them. You've got them, the IAQA, I mean, RIA, they're, they're all over the place. Um, they're more and more popular, especially with the COVID. Now, what's AIHA doing? I mean, to kind of maybe stand out and are, are you doing a lot of webinars and how are you positioning those webinars? Are they mostly COVID-19 related or are they uh, a group? I know we talked about this a little earlier, but I just wanted to give you a chance to, to uh, expand on that a little bit. Well, Joe, look at all the time you're saving about not having to travel, right? So you have yeah. more time to listen to webinars. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, yeah. So when we made the decision to convert the uh, AIHC to a virtual conference, unfortunately, we could not accommodate all the dozens and dozens and dozens of speakers and sessions that were in the original program. So we are going to be reaching out to those that were not included in virtual, and we're going to look at airing a series of webcasts throughout the summer. Now, no promises to anybody who did not make the program, but we are going to make a conscious effort to figure out how do we continue the learning experience for many months to come? And, and how do we you know, take advantage of all the hard work that those speakers put into submitting their abstracts and developing their presentations only to find out that they weren't included in the virtual conference? I could certainly understand the frustration and we're really sorry about that. So we do wanna leverage what we've got uh, in the kitty 
and figure out how we continue the AIHC learning experience later on in the year. The other thing we're doing is I mentioned the professional development courses and how, you know, these are really hard to, to migrate from a full day face to face to an online experience. I mean, nobody wants to sit for eight hours on their computer attending a PDC. That is very tiresome. So we're trying to figure out how do we take some of the PDCs that we normally would have featured at conference and how do we take perhaps snippets of them and create multi-part webinars out of them in the months to come. So that's kind of where we're thinking at this point. So you will be having a, uh, a lot more webinars as time goes on because you just couldn't fit it all into your conference. I can understand that. How many, how many tracks will the conference have now? I think you may have mentioned that before. I'm just five. curious. Yeah, we'll have, uh, we'll have five different tracks. You're still going to have five, okay. Each track's going to run pretty much all day long, except for, of course, those general sessions at the beginning and the end. But again, because uh, you know, there's less networking, well, there is no networking built into the virtual. There are, there are going to be breaks throughout the day, so you can stretch your legs and grab a coffee or a bite to eat. But again, we're able to cram more of the uh, CM hours into the experience. So. How does this, um, I know many associations, their conference is kind of their big, their big money maker for the year, let's, let's face it. Um, how do you see that affecting, how do you see the change to a virtual webinar affecting the finances? Do you think it's going to be a big hit for AIHA this year? Well, we already know that it is, and uh, the conference itself is a very large pr a proportion of our total gross revenues. Uh, it's about 20 to 25 percent of mm -hmm. our gross revenue. So you can imagine when you pivot from a face to face and you lose all the exhibitor dollars and all those attendees that are uh, there for the networking and those that are not signing up for the virtual, it's a very large financial hit to the organization. But it's not just AIHCE, it's other programs that are unfortunately uh, becoming adversely affected because of COVID. So we have already started to relook at our finances and projections for the year and figuring out ways that we can uh, reduce our expenses and our overhead to the best of our ability. I will say that we're a very financially healthy organization and we will survive this without any problem. And we're very fortunate that we have healthy reserves in the bank, but it is a very large hit to any association and AIHA is no exception. It's got to be tough to, to look down the road, Larry. I mean, you know, typically these things are planned a couple years in advance. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking for 2021? Is, uh, do you suspect this may still be, you know, you won't be able to put together large groups of people in one place in 2021 and, and you may have to go virtual again? Or uh, how are you handling that? That is a very good question. And I I'm not even going to answer it because God forbid we're in this position a year from now. But let me tell you that looking ahead a little more shorter term, I mentioned that there is a, an allied association called the Product Stewardship Society, a much smaller event that we hold typically in the fall. Their event is scheduled for September and we're not sure what's going to happen yet. Um, you know, we don't know where we're going to be with the whole COVID experience, but we do know that there are other events that do not bring in any revenue to the association that we're gonna to have to postpone to 2021. So with a careful eye towards expense control, we wanna be mindful of those events that are not mission critical, that we can decide to postpone to the next year. And let's hope that with medications that are able to you know, mitigate the symptoms that people experience, as well as this uh, holy grail vaccine that's gonna come hopefully within the next eight to 12 months, by the time we get to the 2021 conference, Let's all hope and pray that we're in really good shape. And I'll leave it at that. I, I hope you're right. I, I, I agree. Let's, uh, let's hope that comes around. Before we go, Larry, anything that we missed that you'd like to add? Any final thoughts? I have really thoroughly enjoyed this experience and the opportunity to talk a little bit about the association. And I really want to thank you for uh, reaching out to us and giving us this chance. And we're very delighted to step up and be a uh, official sponsor for the IAQ podcast moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Larry Sloan, the CEO, I almost called you the executive director, the CEO of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Uh, it's been uh, very interesting and uh, very, I, I enjoyed uh, getting a chance to talk to you a little bit, learn a little bit more about AIHA. 
So this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks so much to this week's guest. I want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Um, oh, next week we've got Pat Moffat on. We're going to talk to Patrick Moffat. Many of you in the restoration world know Pat, and he, he actually recently had a, a near – a uh, very close call, uh, got very sick after being exposed to some bacteria on a project, and he wants to come out and talk to listeners a little bit about uh, some of the hazards that maybe we overlook on some of these projects. So we're going to have Pat on next Friday at noon. Uh, thanks to our growing group of loyal listeners. We welcome all back next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening.